Hello everyone and welcome to The Curiosity Show, the show that widens your knowledge of the world around you. I'm Lara. And I'm Megan and today it's day four of the Festival of Science and Curiosity. This festival is a whole week celebrating all things sciencey, and we're here to show you some of the weird and wonderful things happening in the world around us. Plus, there's lots of in-person events happening over the weekend and into half term that you can go to with your family wherever you are in Nottinghamshire. But first, today's show and what an exciting show we've got for you. We're going to take part in a neuroscience quiz, visit Colic Woods and we might even get to meet a few creepy crawlies. So much to come, but first comes first and we're going to dive in to what we can do to reduce our plastic waste. You may have already heard about the plastic waste problem. We have too much plastic waste and a poor waste disposal system. David Attenborough has raised awareness of the huge amount of plastic pollution in the ocean. It is estimated 1 million birds and 100,000 sea animals die each year due to plastic waste. If you think that's bad, it also contributes to climate change. Plastic is made from oil and during the production process, harmful gases are released into the atmosphere. Something has to change. Okay, so plastic is bad and it's causing a lot of problems, so let's just ban it. It's not that easy though. Plastic is very, very valuable and often it is the best material for the job. Instead, we need to reduce how much plastic we use, reuse the plastic we already have and improve the recycling of plastic as well. One of the solutions to the plastic waste problem is to use less plastic. We can do this by swapping to non-plastic alternatives, reusing plastic items you already have, and buying products that you can reuse over and over again. Even if we reduce and reuse plastic, we will always have more plastic waste. Most of our plastic waste, however, can go into recycling bins. Household recycling waste is collected by the council and taken to a sorting facility. It goes on a conveyor belt and is sorted by material type as often, recycling waste is a mix of both plastic, paper, metal and glass. After the plastic is separated, it is given to a plastic recycling company. And now the recycling process can properly begin. Currently, most plastic waste is recycled mechanically. This means that the plastic is physically broken down into smaller parts. There are many steps such as grinding, shredding and chopping to create smaller flakes. The flakes are then washed and melted to create pellets and these pellets can be used to make new plastic products. But this process has some big disadvantages. All of that grinding and pressure damage the plastic. The damage gets worse each time it's recycled. Eventually, the plastic is sent to landfill or it's burned as it is too weak to be used for anything anymore. But there are other plastic recycling technologies, but they're just not as common. Our research hopes to change this you can use chemical or biological recycling technologies. Instead of physically changing the plastic, these methods chemically break down the plastic to its original chemicals. Mechanical recycling starts off with plastic and ends with plastic, but just in smaller pieces. Chemical and biological recycling both start off with plastic and finish up with chemicals. These chemicals can then be used to make brand new plastic or they can be used to make something else entirely. I am working on a chemical recycling process that uses microwaves. Now, it is a bit more complicated than just putting your empty bottle in the microwave and pressing start. So please don't try this at home. I am using microwave heating as it is more effective than normal heating. For example, heating up your leftovers in a microwave is faster than putting them into the oven. This is because microwaves heat things from the inside and out, whereas normal heating heats things from the outside in. That's why you might find a really soft spot in your microwave leftovers sometimes. Some foods are better at being heated in a microwave compared to others. This is to do with how the food molecules uh, interact with the microwave heating. It's the same principle for plastics. Some plastics will be heated better than others when they are exposed to microwave heating. I am working on a biological recycling process, which is a bit more natural as it uses bacteria and enzymes found in the environment. So you could say that these plants are a good representation of my research. 
many microorganisms can be useful. For example, the bacteria and enzymes that break down food in our stomachs. Biological recycling works in the same way. Some microorganisms in the environment have evolved to break down plastic. For example, some have been found in landfill sites. These microorganisms have been surrounded by plastic and adapted to break it down and use it as food. This does not mean mutant microorganisms will take over the world and start eating all plastic in sight. This evolution takes time and is quite rare. Plastic is hard to break down, so only a few microorganisms can do it. Chemical and biological recycling don't damage plastic the same way that mechanical recycling does. Instead, valuable chemicals are produced. The plastic can go through these processes over and over again and won't be damaged and therefore won't wind up in landfill or be burnt. Thanks so much to the guys from the University of Nottingham for telling us a bit more about what happens to our plastic recycling once we put it in the bin. Now time to look at some creepy crawlies. If you're not a fan of spiders, then this one might not be for you. But the University of Nottingham Spider Lab are going to tell us why there's more to the crawling creatures than meets the eye. I'm Ella Deutsch um, and I've recently been a PhD student here at the Spider Lab um, and then handed in my thesis um, last week. Uh, so here's where we house uh, all our animals. Um, so animals we use in teaching and outreach and research. Um, because of Covid and the way the lab is at the moment, we don't have a huge amount of animals um, and so there's not a, a lot of residents. Uh, sometimes when we need a lot of research animals or we're doing a lot of teaching, we can have up to 100 or 200 spiders in here. Um, as well as cockroaches and stick insects, a variety of insects and other arthropods. But the spiders are the main stars of the show in here. So at the moment we've got two permanent residents. Um, so over here we've got Pumpkin, um, who's our red meat tarantula. Um, she's, I want to say, about five years old. Um, we've had her for a little while, but unfortunately she never really got used to people. Um, so it's minimal handling for her. We just open the tank to, to clean her out or to feed her. Um, she's a little bit nervous of people, which is fair enough. We're a lot bigger than her and tarantulas can actually be quite delicate. Um, and so we leave her be. Uh, but then we've also got Sophia, who's over here, and she's much more friendly. We got her when she was only a few months old. She was really little. We got her used to being handled, used to coming out to school events um, and to university uh, practicals and things like that. Um, so she's really friendly, she'll come out on her hands um, and be really uh, handleable. This is Sophia. Um, she's probably about between three and four years old. And we got her when she was very young and got her used to being handled and out and about. So she's been to all sorts of primary school events, teaching sessions here at the university, uh, science festivals, that sort of thing. So you can actually see two spiders here. We've got a shed skin here. Um, which is Sophia's old shed skin. She's grown recently and to do that she needs to shed her old exoskeleton and she's just a touch bigger than she was before that. Um, so I'll move that out of the way and grab her out. Here you can see she's very calm and relaxed. You can tell if a tarantula is getting a bit antsy they'll move around a little bit more um, but you can tell that she's not doing any of that. So tarantulas have quite a large quantity of venom because they're so big, but actually that venom isn't very potent towards humans. It's designed for crickets and little things they might catch. Um, so it'd be a bit like a bee sting if she bit me, uh, not particularly serious. Um, very few spiders are actually harmful to humans. Um, and no tarantulas and certainly no spiders that live in this country. So you can see there she's spinning lots of threads of silk at the same time. So tarantulas use their silk a bit like a sheet to go over their uh, substrate and around their burrows. It acts a bit like tripwires and also they wrap it around food to keep it fresh. So my name is Sarah Goodacre and a number of years ago I found, founded the Spider Lab here at Nottingham University and I'm really happy to say it's not just me working on spiders here anymore but a range of other people have also shown that they're interested. So we study spiders for a whole range of different reasons but all because we're really interested in finding out how the natural world works. 
So right here I have some angular pigeons. Now these are arachnids, eight-legged creatures, um, that people might or might not, I think some of them are shown on the Harry Potter films, some of them, so you'll see some of the, the creatures there. So they don't spin silk, which actually means that they don't form part of a lot of the research in the lab, which is focused particularly on spider silk. But they are a really interesting example of really what we don't know. So what some people in my group have found is that there are particular microorganisms, fungi, things that you can't see with the naked eye, that live on lachnids. And actually they're new to science, so we didn't know they existed before, and now we do. We're not quite sure what these fungi do, uh, or how important they are, but probably they illustrate to me just the amazing intricacy of the things that are around you, and how much fun you can have trying to work out what it all means. Amazing research, but I still hope I won't come across one of those in my <laughs> bathtub. <laughs> right, it's challenge time now, as it's time for today's Guess, guess that, that Sound! And we've got a really good one for you today. Let's see if you can guess what animal this is. Uh, let's hear it one more time. Do you know what animal that is? Find out after the break. I've been a UNICEF ambassador for 18 years and I have been sent to some extreme humanitarian emergencies from the Congo to Afghanistan. Believe me, the people suffering the most in all of them were the children. Today, the war in Yemen is putting over 12 million children in danger. Many children are so sick and malnourished that without food, water and basic health care, they could die. So we ask, what can we do? We have to do something. One thing we could do is search UNICEF Yemen online or text HELP to 83080 to find out how you can help. Just five pounds could help provide life-saving food to feed a child for a week. I have seen UNICEF's work for myself in extreme emergencies. It saves lives and it saves childhoods. We must act now. I'm pleading with you to give from your hearts. Search UNICEF Yemen online or text HELP to 83080 and help save a child's life today. With Post Office Over 50's Life Cover, you can have the time of your life. Safe in the knowledge will pay out money when your time is up. UK resident, 50 to 80, your guaranteed acceptance. No health checks and from just £1.15 a week. Plus, you'll even get to choose a £100 gift card. Call Post Office now on 0800 171 Welcome back to the Curiosity Show. Now, before we break we, the break, we ask you to guess what animal makes this sound. <coughs> Did you guess it right? It's a wolf. Well done if you got that at home. Did you know that wolves eat undulates, which means that they eat animals with hooves like deer and moose? Well, I didn't know that, but I do now. Now, time to meet today's scientists. As you've seen, we've spoken to lots of scientists throughout this week, so we can find out what it's like to do their job and what they learn about. Today, we're talking to Stephanie Hanley, who's a researcher, and she's been looking at the best way for hospitals and labs to continue appointments and research throughout the pandemic. Currently researching how well units across England have implemented the guidance around the pandemic and how they need to change their practices to fit in with um, controlling the infection. I 
think the fact that you're, um, you're researching areas that ultimately are improving individuals' experiences um, and individuals' um, kind of care in certain settings. So my PhD research, an interesting fact related to that is that involving new mums in the design of their weight loss programmes creates better outcomes for them. Go for it. Science is so broad you'll, you'll no doubt find your niche within science. I'd have to take my cat. <laughs> Seeing new mums lose the weight and take part in marathons that they never thought they'd be able to do without taking part in studies that I've run. That we all wear white coats and work in labs with test tubes. <laughs> I used a DEXA scanner during my PhD which basically works out people's body composition, so the amount of muscle, fat, bone, um, and I think that's a fascinating bit of equipment. I used to want to be a vet. The kind of scientist I am, I'm very much a might turn up on my gym leggings, might turn up on my jeans, but I'm definitely not a white coat scientist. I guess the unknown around what what's going to happen day to day, but I quite like that because you don't know um, what you're going to find out from one day to the next, but I think that keeps it exciting. Thanks Stephanie. Now it's time to find out some interesting facts about all things neuroscience and the brain. Let's take part in a quiz brought to you by some students from the University of Nottingham. Hi everyone and welcome to today's episode of Brain Busters, the game show where we bust biological myths. I'm Rachel and I'll be your host for today. Time to meet the contestants. Hi guys, I'm Chrissy. I study in Nottingham and my favourite neuroscience topic is how we process pain. Hi guys, I'm Antonio. I'm from Eastbourne and my favourite topic is the brain and ageing. Nice to meet you guys, it's time to crack on with the questions. Before we get started, just a reminder that both of our contestants have a buzzer and phone a friend option if either of them gets stuck on any of the questions. Okay, question number one. The bigger the brain, the more intelligent you are. True or false? Guys, I have an interesting fact. Did you know that the biggest brain in the world belongs to a sperm whale? It can weigh up to nine kilograms. And the answer to the question has to be false. No way does a bigger brain make you smarter. Ding, 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 that's correct. Well, we're more intelligent than sperm whales. Of course the answer has to be false. Having a bigger brain doesn't make you more intelligent. Humans are the most intelligent species on the planet. However, as Antonio mentioned, we definitely don't have the biggest brain. Scientists that study the brain believe that it's the complexity in the way the cells are organised and how efficiently they communicate with one another that makes us the most intelligent species. Neurons, which are the scientific name for brain cells, are shaped a bit like stars. They can make tens of thousands of connections with other neurons, and in this way, they can send information to each other, allowing us to see, think, and do things. Okay, so how many neurons are there in the human brain? Good question. The human brain has 86 billion neurons. Billion means there are nine zeros after it. That's a huge number, right? Imagine how tiny those brain cells must be to fit in your skull. It's impossible to see neurons normally, and that's why scientists use microscopes to study them. Okay, on to question number two. So contestants, are you smarter than your phone? No. My phone can do lots of cool things that I can't. I don't think I'm smarter than my phone at all. Unfortunately, that is an incorrect answer. While your brain doesn't use as much electricity as a smartphone, the brain is still super advanced compared to the modern phone. Our brain is able to perform lots of complex actions. For example, swimming is a very complex activity as it uses almost all the muscles in the body, and the timing of each muscle must be perfect. Otherwise, you just flail around in the water. Also, your brain can tell the difference between the five senses. You can distinguish between dark and milk chocolate, just from the taste. You can smell a cake that's baking in the oven. These are all tasks that your phone cannot do, as it's very limited in what it can perform. So, you're a lot smarter than your phone, as you can perform a wider range of actions and process more complicated senses. On to question number four. As an adult, you cannot produce new brain cells. True or false? 
Uh, mm, actually, can I call a friend? You sure can. Who are you going to call? Choose wisely. Basant, she'll know the answer. Hello? Hello, is that Basant? Yes, it is. Hi, Basant. You're live on Brain Busters. I have Antonio here, and he's stuck on a question and is hoping you'll be able to help. Are you ready to hear the question? Yeah, of course. I'm ready. Okay, here we go. As an adult, you cannot produce new brain cells. True or false? Mm, that's a tricky one because this topic has been heavily debated for a really long time. I know babies produce lots of new brain cells during brain development and the process of making new brain cells is called neurogenesis. So historically, people believed that only children had the ability to produce new brain cells, but more recently, studies have reported that certain areas of adult brains um, are capable of neurogenesis. Being able to produce new healthy brain cells could be really important to preventing memory loss and um, other brain diseases that cause a gradual decline in brain cells. And I'm pretty sure that I read an article recently um, about the importance of exercise on ad in adulthood and the benefits, including the production of new brain cells in adults. So I would say that the answer is false because, well, we know that adults can produce new brain cells. Okay, this is our final question, so fingers on buzzers, please. How do our brain cells communicate and send signals to each other? Is it A, by chemical signals, B, by infrared radiation, or C, by magnetic signals? The answer is B, infrared radiation. Unfortunately, that's an incorrect answer. It is in fact A. Brain cells communicate with each other using chemical signals. Let me explain. Between two brain cells, there's a gap called a synapse. This means that the brain cells need to somehow get their message across this gap in order to reach the next cell. The first cell contains little bubbles full of chemicals called neurotransmitters. When the message arrives in the first cell, these neurotransmitters are released into the synapse via a process called exocytosis. Once in the synapse, these chemical messengers travel across and bind to receptors on the second cell. Upon binding, the neurotransmitters trigger the signal to start in the second cell, just like a game of Chinese whispers. Pretty cool, eh? Hey? So at the end of today's show, our contestants have done a great job at busting myths. How did you get on at home? That's it for today. Thank you for joining, and we look forward to seeing you next time on another neuroscience episode. So it's goodbye from me, and goodbye from our contestants. Goodbye. goodbye. The Joy of the Show. So for those that you, of you who were watching yesterday, you'll remember that we set up an experiment at the end of the programme and to leave it overnight and to come back to it today. And well, here we are. We've defi it's definitely a live experiment because it hasn't worked exactly as we wanted it to. If you remember what we did is we added in some red food colouring into this water, we added some blue into this one and yellow into this one. And what we were expecting to find is that today we would come and this one would be orange, this one would be green and this one would be purple. And now this one has worked and we can see that this, the colour here has turned a kind of orangey colour. But unfortunately, the others haven't. Now, I don't know if, about you, but if you've ever done an experiment at school or at home that hasn't quite worked, it's a bit disappointing. But that's what science is all about. Sometimes things go wrong and actually we learn by by having things go wrong and I think some of the things that I might have done wrong and I would change for next time I might use more dye I might make sure that I'm measuring my dye properly um, and I think maybe my paper towel was a little bit too thick let us know how you got on if you tried at home um, and um, and if you've got more you want to do more kind of science experiments and demonstrations remember you can head over to our Australian friends on the, Cur the Curiosity Show, check out their YouTube channel and they've got lots and lots more activities that you can do. Later in the show, we're going to have Michael and Johnny from Box Lab do a really, really exciting experiment over here, um, so stay tuned. And we're going to come back to the Curiosity Board now. Now, if you remember, throughout the week, we've been adding to the Curiosity Board everything that we've been learning. And look, look at how full it's getting. So we're going to add today's objects. So we've got a spider's web because we went to the spider lab at University of Nottingham. 
We've got some grass because later in Rick's demo, he's going to teach us how to make a squeak with a blade of grass. We're going to head over to Colic Woods and we're also going to learn about some ivy bees. So let's get those on the board. Let's get them on. Let's put one over here as well. Brilliant. So look how full it's getting. And tomorrow we're going to add our final pieces so that we can learn so much. And I'm actually shocked at how much we are learning. So still to come on the show today, we're going to learn about some ivy bees. We're going to make a, make a blade of grass squeak. And we're also going to see how we can go trees as quickly as possible. We'll see you in a bit. Watson, director of Watson's Estate Agents, and this is Francesca, Angelina, John and Laura. We're going to be giving you our top five tips for selling your home. <music> Tip one, get your ducks in a row. Uh, start by having a look online, get in a feel for what's out there in the market. Uh, a lot of properties are selling before they even get online, so I would advise you to register with a good local estate agent to get advance notice on uh, some of these properties that are, are going to be coming onto the market, get a good flavour for it. Then ask them out to do a valuation on your own property and that's going to give you a good feel on uh, what your budget might be going forward and also that a good reliable local estate agent will have access to a good um, independent mortgage advisor and they will also uh, give you a good sense of your affordability. Tip number two is choose the right estate agent. So it's really important you get this right, have a look around the area and online, see who's selling the most properties in your area and they'll be the agent that will normally have the most buyers on their database. So that's a really good place to start from because you can get viewings even before you get yours online. Um, also think about are they on social media using that, it's a really good tool. Are they on all the major web portals and when are they available to speak to my buyers? Okay, top tip number three is prepare your property. Curb appeal is really important for a first impression to a buyer. So little things like take the car off the driveway to show the space. If there is any clutter, you can see a bit of garden waste there, just put it away in the bin and, and certainly keep the bin out of view as best you can. So come inside, there'll be some more tips. Okay, so another good first impression, quite a light, spacious hallway. Shoes are all out of the way with a shoe cupboard there, so that's good. As we go through, we've got little Jesse here. Not ideal um, as a distraction when you're trying to show people your home, so uh, try and keep pets out of the way as best you can. So kitchens are a really important room in the house. It can be very costly if you feel it needs replacing and you can't afford it. There is actually an option that you might not be aware of of just recovering the cupboard doors, and that can be done on a budget. So that's worth thinking about. But this one's really nice, simple, uncluttered, nice smells of coffee or bread in the background is always, it's a cliche but it's true. Um, but a really important thing is before you think about getting the property on the market, if you are aware of any damp or electrical issues, it's really important you get that sorted first because that's the number one thing that will put buyers off. So my top tip to you would be to work with your estate agents and communicate we're a proactive agent and before your property's hitting the property portals such as Rightmove and Zoopla, we're already mailing it out to thousands of registered buyers that we have on our database. These are your hottest buyers ready to trot. So we need you to communicate, check that your emails aren't going to your junk folder and answer that phone and be flexible with any viewings. My top tips for completing the sale of your home are completing your fixtures and fittings form as quickly as possible. Decide what you're leaving at the earliest stage. Secondly, I would choose a solicitor that has a good working relationship with your estate agent as this is most important in getting the transaction to be as smooth as possible. And lastly, as eager as you are, please do not book your removals until a date is confirmed as until you exchange contracts, their date is not legally binding. Hello 
and welcome back to The Curiosity Show, the show that shows you everything about the world around you. Now, don't forget, if you enjoy anything in the show and want some more information on the festival, head over to our website, www.notsfosac.co.uk and get in touch with Megan and I on social media at notsfosac using the hashtag Curious Knots. Now, I've got Richard joining me in the studio today from the Canal and River Trust. Hi, Richard, how are you doing? Hello, I'm great, thank you. Fabulous. So, can you talk to me a little bit about what you do? Yep. Um, so, I work for the, the Canal and River Trust. We're the charity that protects and maintains the waterways, that is, canals and rivers um, around, around the country, including here in Knots. And can you tell me what you've been doing recently as well? Um, yeah, recently we've been doing a load of maintenance work on one of the locks on the River Trent in Newark. Um, maintenance is needed because canals are really important places and rivers. Um, they're historic, 200 years old, that kind of thing. Great places for nature, but also being, as we know, being by nature and out is really good for people's physical and mental well-being. But you can only keep them accessible that way if you maintain them and look after them. So we've been doing some of that maintenance work in Newark right now. Definitely, and we've actually got an image of one of the places that you've been working recently. Can you talk me through that a little bit? Yeah, um, when the picture comes up, you're down here at the moment, down at the bottom of the lock chamber in Newark. You can see Newark Castle there in the distance. Normally that's not a shot you could see because all the water has been taken out, so you're seven or eight metres below the normal water level down. So that looks like a canal, but that was actually a river that we saw there. Yep. This might be a bit of a silly question, but <laughs> why do we have to drain rivers? Yeah. Um, so, yes, that's right. That's a lock on the river because it's a navigable river that um, it was constructed to allow freight and commercial traffic to use. So it needed to be deep enough to make sure that the big vessels could use it back in the, you know, prior to the Industrial Revolution and since. But, you know, old structures need maintaining and the gates on these locks need replacing kind of every 25 years and that's a big job because those are big they're sort of eight tons each four of them all got to be specially made brought down by the water and we've got to take in order to replace those gates we've got to take all the water out of the lock and surely when you take all the water out of the lock you'll find some curious things at the bottom yeah that's right yeah when you're in places that you can't normally get to you find something a bit <laughs> odd so um we found um you know earlier this winter you can see in this picture here this is a chinese mitten crab that's actually quite a big shovel that it's sitting on there and they're native to east asia and they probably got into the country early 1900s in the ballast you know the water that sits at the bottom of commercial freight in the, in the chinese estuary and you don't normally see those things. And you found some, some other things that aren't animals as well. That's right. Well, actually, um, the next picture, you can see a freshwater sponge. Now, freshwater sponges are animals, actually. They're quite a, a primitive one. But um, it, here you can see it just in the foreground on that picture. And I think people would imagine, apart from your bath sponge, they're the kind of things you'd say, oh, in the Mediterranean, you know, you go diving for them or something. Um, but, you know, they live under the water um, in fresh waters as well and you could see them on the bottom of the old lock gates that are sitting on the side. Amazing. Thank you so much for joining me. That's Richard from the Canal and River Trust. A sponge is an animal. I never knew that. Um, anyway, we're heading over to Woodthorpe Park now to see how you make a Maya Wacky style forest. The I'm Adam Pickering from Green Hustle and the Hockley Hustle Collective and we are planting Notting City Centre area's first Miyawaki style mini forest today. Um, this is a really exciting new type of tree planting where we plant lots of different varieties of mixed native trees species all together very closely and as you can see we're planting, planting them out in this big spiral. Um, there's going to be lots of different varieties, they'll all be serving different jobs in the canopy, uh, underground, they'll be speaking to each other through the mycorrhizal fungi networks, yes trees speak to each other, um, so they'll all be sharing nutrients and helping each other grow and they should grow really quickly and within the space of a couple of years um, they'll, they'll establish themselves into a forest. Hi, I'm Rachel Richards and I've been asked by Green Hustle to design the Mayawaki style tiny forest at Woodthorpe Park. The Kila Mayawaki um, 
decided to plant trees that, in a way that would mimic a natural forest because he observed that trees in a natural forest grow close together and they grow ten times faster than trees that we plant uh, a metre to eight foot apart. We have 15 varieties of tree all native British trees and the reason why we've got British native trees is that they will grow better in our soil in Woodthorpe Park to be suited to these conditions and they will enable biodiversity to flourish not only of the vegetation but also bird life, insect life and life of small mammals in this area. My name is Rosemary Healy. I'm a councillor for Muckley Ward. It's going to be a fantastic contribution to our targets to plant 50,000 trees in Nottingham. And uh, this project today has lots of volunteers. Um, Green Hustle have organised it, and it's a very, very impressive project. Hi, I'm Ella. Um, I'm a poet based in Nottingham and Leeds, um, and I'm here today to get to know more about the project, what's going on, the people, the communities around it. Um, Leanne from the UNESCO City of Literature uh, in Nottingham asked me to be a part of this, um, and it's part of a commission to write a poem um, about the reasons that this forest is being created. Uh, I was really drawn to it because of the intermingling of the species and the way that they support each other. Um, my experience living in Nottingham over like five or six years was all about community, community support, the way that community arts really cares about people, really cares about people as individuals, but also with the way that they can support, encourage and engage with each other. And I think that this forest is almost just like the perfect metaphor for that. Um, the way that each tree and its roots web together from the fungi that grows underneath helps to encourage all of the different species to grow um, and you can sort of see there's so many different people from so many different communities here who have picked up the project throughout um, the, the progress of it and come along and been part of it. I think it's just really encompasses that spirit of community that we've been lacking for the last couple of years. We've not been able to meet. Um, so I think it's a beautiful project and super unique. Planting with volunteers like brings a real community spirit to the area um, and gives the, gives the trees kind of some ownership by the local community so we know that they're going to be kind of cared for um, for years to come which will, which will help with their growth. Oh, uh, it's a beautiful day, I've got both my grandchildren here so uh, what I can't think of a better thing to do than to plant trees. <laughs> Try to make a change, even though it's just a small change, but still every little thing matters. Um, and uh, we're part of like Lejna and Mala, so we're, just, we're a team trying to like uh, like a, like a community around ethnic Muslim community, and we're trying to mark our hundred century. So it's such a nice opportunity. It felt, it felt like really, it was really fun. It was. It was really fun planting the trees. It's been rewarding, hasn't it? Putting yeah. something back in. Yeah. Something yeah. we can come back and revisit. Yeah, yeah. yeah earlier this year, um, uh, one of our best friends passed away, and we thought like this would be something to like you know remember or come to. He was cremated, so there was no like physical um, place for us to go to in in case we ever needed it or whatever. And we thought it would be nice to have like you know something like a tree, which will act as like a physical placeholder as in, in memory of him. So, yeah. Love. And what's been your favourite part about today so far? Uh, probably getting muddy. <laughs> the favourite thing is giving something back, knowing that I've left something behind that's going to have a longer lasting impact on the world. You know, trying to make the world a better place. Amazing. You know, so it's the best you can do, make the most of it. And Green Hustle are going to be running a festival this summer all about green issues, so keep your eyes peeled for that. That's going to be really exciting. 
If you also enjoyed meeting Richard before that little video, then Richard's also got an event on. It's on the 26th and 27th of February, where you can go into the bottom of a lock in a river um, and find maybe find some amazing creatures for yourself. So head over to the Canal and River Trust website forward slash open days for more information on that as well. Now it's time for another um, video from Rick. Here's a nice trick that you can do to make sounds. And again, it illustrates that sounds are made out of vibrations. So if you find a nice piece of grass like this, shaped a bit like a spear, nice and thin, you can make a nice bird call out of it. So if you place a piece of grass between your fingers and your thumbs like this, so that you make a nice little gap like that, if you're really careful, it takes a bit of practice, but you can then blow. Well, that sounds a bit more like a bittern than a bird call, doesn't it? But let's try this. That's nice and loud, isn't it? Just from a piece of grass. So cool, I'm definitely going to try that next time I'm on a walk. Right, now we have another challenge for you before we go to the break. It's time for another microscope picture from the University of Nottingham School of Life Sciences Imaging Facility, taken through a microscope, and we want you to guess what you think it is. Here's our picture for today. Now, what do you think this is? Have a look at maybe the patterns and the shapes and the textures. Is it familiar to you? Find out what it is after the break. Okay. Here we go. Hello, I'm Helen and I'm Kerry and we run the Little London Herbal Stores and we're here to give you our five top winter health tips. My top tip for looking after my skin during the winter is to use the Willida Skin Food. I like to use this on my elbows, on my hands when they're chapped, and also for flip-flop season in the summer when you get the hard skin on your heels. It's a really, really thick cream that goes in lovely. It's not for everyday use, but for everyday, we've got the Skin Food Body Lotion, which you can use all over after your shower, and the Skin Food Light, which goes under your makeup. My next top tip is to take the Immune Boost Tablet by Nature's Plus. It's a one a day tablet that contains your vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin C, and mushrooms to help keep your immune system healthy and keep away colds and flus. And did you know that some mushrooms are really good for helping increase your immune system and also helping with respiratory issues? So this is my favourite top tip and this is Echinacea in a hot drink. Echinacea is really good for boosting the immune system and fighting coughs and colds. All you need to do is pop a teaspoon of the liquid in a cup, pour on boiling water and you've got a really soothing, comforting drink that's going to have a lot of health benefits. Another of my top health tips is to take vitamin D liquid. Vitamin D is important all year round, but especially during the winter months as we don't get it from the sunshine. I like the liquid version better because it seems to be easier absorbed and it also tastes quite nice and it's a bit different from taking a tablet every day. So this is my top tip for sore throats. This is really, really good if you've got a sore throat. You just rip the top off and drink the contents and it coats your throat, it coats the mucous membranes. It's, it's not horrible like a lot of preparations that you use. It's quite um, lemony, minty sort of thing, but it really takes away the sore throat quickly. You know what really irritates me? 
ordinary pads and tampons full of plastic and chemicals. You know what doesn't irritate me? Organic pads, tampons, and liners. O-R-G-A-N-Y-C. They're clinically proven to protect my sensitive skin with 100% certified organic cotton. And they provide unsurpassed absorbency, too. Organic. O-R-G-A-N-Y-C. The only clinically proven feminine care brand. Hmm, what a comforting thought. Hello and welcome back to The Curiosity Show. Before the break, we were looking at a picture that some scientists in Nottingham have been looking at this week. Here it is again. Now it looks like fields, but actually this is an image of a microprocessor. A microprocessor is a small chip that you find in a computer and it holds all of the information needed to run the program. If we go back to the original image, you can actually see in the top right there's a little fleck of, of yellow and that's a grain of pollen. And inside that piece of pollen, there's all of the information, all of the DNA needed to grow the flower. And if you look how small that is compared to the chip, it shows just how nature can compact information into such a small space compared to man-made objects like microprocessors. Back to animals now, though. Throughout the week, we've been having a look at lots of insects. We've seen wasps, mining bees, spiders. But have you ever heard of an IDB? <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. And her videos are so informative, and it's, I think it's starting to change my mind about bees and wasps. <laughs> From trees to bees and back to trees, because now we're going to dive right into the centre of Colic Park, and let's take a look at some of the work that volunteers have been doing to look after our environment. The
Uh, so I'm the park manager. So here today we've got a um, partnership working between Knott's Wildlife Trust for Wildlife in the City, in collaboration with uh, Nottingham City Council Range Service. So we're on Connick Park, um, and this corner of woodland here was planted up um, with lots of whips um, some years ago, and we're just going back in and doing the aftercare. So we're checking on them, taking away the tree guards, having a litter pick at the same time, and doing some selective pruning, just to let more light into the, the woodland, so the species can grow on the floor, so the other species can be stronger to the ones that haven't quite um, done so well. So yeah, selective thinning, done a great job. To How many volunteers have we got today? Um, last count was about 10, and then I think we had another four join us. We'll shortly be releasing a whole year's worth of volunteering opportunities for the public. Um, so that should be hopefully at the end of January, so people can uh, visit us on our Facebook site or on our webpage. Um, or a volunteering website to find out all the opportunities that are available in the park throughout the year. Simon, this looks quite a lot of hard work. Well, we're trying to clear some of the scrub and undergrowth for, um, this area around the car park just to open it up and be a bit more welcoming for the visitors to come at Country Park. We've got quite a mix in here. We've got some cherry, some hazel, some elder. We've got a few different ones, and there's the, almost a few small ash trees coming up, which is encouraging. And once you've cleared it and you've got more light coming in, what what will then grow? Well, it depends what's actually here already, but uh, hopefully there'll be some uh, wildflower seeds in the in the ground, which may come up. So there may well be some more small trees come through on their own in the future as well. And, and what about wildlife in this area? Yeah, there should be lots of uh, nice little birds that like the scrub, things like wrens and robins, and possibly during the summer the chiff chaps and such like. We're just removing some of this top cover to try and create some more light space on the ground to promote some growth of some new flora. This is the uh, Knox Wildlife in the City Group, yeah, and we're here volunteering just to try and make this place look a bit nicer. And how long have you been involved? Um, about an hour. <laughs> I want to be involved in the community effort to revitalise our, our local green spaces in the city um, because I think they have incredible value for, for everyone, including you know, our wild inhabitants as well. And so being a part of this, you know, it makes me feel better about myself, to be honest, being able to, to contribute to this bigger effort, um, because I think it's something that we all need to be doing in our green spaces. And it's so important to get out into nature, whether you go to a park or the woods or a lake, visit the river at different times of year, because getting outside is good for us to stay fit and healthy. Now, we've got something really exciting to show you in the studio because we've got Johnny and Mike from Box Lab who are here to do a demonstration. What are you going to be showing us today, guys? Welcome, guys. The Johnny and Mike's from uh, Box Lab. Mike's has got some cool experiments he's going to, he's going to uh, undertake right now. Mike's, take it away. What we've got here? All right, you guys. So, um, I'm going to show you how we can use chemistry to make some cool drinks. So, what I've got here made up like a normal glass of water, but we're going to add our uh, liquid here into our wine glass, and we're going to see what happens. So, we're turning water into wine. Ooh. Okay, but what if you're not a wine drinker and maybe you might prefer a glass of milk? Oh, I like milk. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to turn wine into milk. Ta-da! What's this one here then? Is okay. it going to be orange juice? <laughs> well, maybe you're not a milk drinker, but... You prefer Lucas. Oh. So this is just a number of chemical reactions that are taking place in each of these glasses. Um, and when you know the science, check out Box Lab on Instagram and we explain some of the science behind 
our demonstrations. We've still got one more left for you guys, so take a look and um, yeah, take a look at some dry ice. So I'm sure many of you out there, many of the viewers, I'm sure you've all seen dry ice um, on TikTok. You may have seen it on Instagram. You may have seen it on Facebook. Um, and I want all of you to just take a big deep breath and breathe out. Okay, the gas that you're breathing out is called carbon dioxide. And if you can take that gas and cool it down, you get something called dry ice and you can see the pellets right here now what's cool about dry ice is that dry ice is solid carbon dioxide but it doesn't actually melt when we put it into hot water it starts to sublimate and that means the, the solid turns straight into a gas so johnny let's get let's take a few take a look And you can see here, look, that the carbon dioxide is just sublimating. It doesn't melt, it's turning straight into a gas. <laughs> I could watch this for hours, I could. <laughs> Bit of exfoliation for us. <laughs> <laughs> so, we've got time just to do one last experiment, and this one This one still involves dry ice, but instead we've got a bowl of hot water. <laughs> we've, got, we've got no time, so I'm going to quickly explain. We've got a bowl of hot water. I'm going to quickly <laughs> take a shoelace, and we're going to see if we can get a dry ice 